right. Well, it looks like the bulk of the, the people that were in the waiting room are here with us. Um, so good evening to everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Casey Messick Braun, and I'm the curator of global indigenous art here at the Spencer Museum of Art, as well as the organizer of the Spencer's newly opened exhibition, Healing, Knowing, Seeing the Body, which I invite you to visit in person or explore virtually on our website. And my colleague Adina is going to be putting some links in the chat for you to make a reservation or to look at the virtual exhibition. Healing Knowing Seeing the Body features more than 150 works of art ranging from ancient to contemporary that demonstrate how understandings of the body and its many complexities have changed through time, been mediated through different cultural contexts, and ultimately serve to connect us to one another. And I'm really glad that you're here to join us for our first Body Matters series of conversations which invites artists featured in Healing, Knowing, Seeing the Body to introduce their work and engage in dialogue with one another and all of you to explore issues related to health and the human body through art. Tonight, I am delighted to welcome Ingrid Bachman and Sean Caulfield, um, two Canadian-based artists who are involved in innovative, collaborative, and transdisciplinary research at the intersection of art and medicine. Ingrid Bachman is serving as the Spencer Museum's International Artist in Residence and currently serves as a professor of studio arts at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. She's created several works as part of Hybrid Bodies, a multidisciplinary research and artistic project focused on exploring the complexities of organ transplantation by raising questions about bodily integrity, personal identity, and the relationship between organ recipients and their donors. Her work has been exhibited throughout Canada and internationally in the United States, Peru, Brazil, Germany, Belgium, Scotland, Australia, and sunny Cuba. Sean Caulfield is a printmaker and a centennial professor in the Department of Art and Design at the University of Alberta, living and working in Treaty 6 territory. His work often explore themes related to health in the body, climate change in the environment, and ethics and society. And he has exhibited his prints, drawings, and artist books extensively throughout Canada, the US, Europe, and Japan. Before I turn the uh, program over to them, I wanted to set some expectation for tonight's event and run through a few housekeeping items. So in the first half hour of tonight's program, Ingrid and Sean will individually present for about 12 minutes each on their work. And then in the second half, they'll engage in conversation with one another. And we eagerly invite your questions and comments during this portion of the program. We hope that it will be informal and conversational. Um, a few other things I want to note. Um, the first is that we are recording this session and we enjoy seeing you on screen. But if you prefer anonymity or to be off screen, you can uh, rename your profile and or turn your camera off. And turning your camera off um, can also help if you're having an unstable internet connection. We do ask that you keep your mic on mute unless you are asking a question. Live captions are available in English and you can click the CC button at the bottom of your screen to turn those on. Um, my colleagues Aiden and Adina will be monitoring the chat throughout the event, so please post questions or comments there at any time and they will reply and share them with us. And you can also unmute to ask questions directly during the second half. Um, if we experience unforeseen technical difficulties, we may need to end early. If you need any technical assistance during the program, please feel free to call Adina at 785-864. 0216, and she's going to post that number in the chat as well. All of the supporters listed on this slide helped make Healing, Knowing, Seeing the Body and associated public events possible. I want to specifically thank the Spencer Museum of Arts International Artists in Residence Fund and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation's Integrated Arts Research Initiative and Sawyer Seminar for making tonight's program possible. So with that, I am excited to invite Ingrid Bachman to begin her presentation. So Ingrid, welcome. Thank you, Casey, so much. And, and I just can't say how delighted I am to be here, how sorry I am I can't actually be in Lawrence, Kansas with you and Sean and, and everyone else. And to just give an enormous thanks to Casey and the entire Spencer team that have just done incredible work in, you know, during a pandemic. So. Um, I'm very honored to be part of the show. I'm going to be showing some work that 
is in the exhibition, but also some earlier work that I think links to the themes of healing, knowing, seeing the body. And this is in, uh, it's, a, it's a detail of a piece I have in the show called Pelt Bestiary, which is a series of um, seven sculptures. Some are kinetic, which means they move of their own accord. Some are interactive, which so they respond to um, people's presence and others are inert. And in this work, maybe we'll go to the next slide. I was really interested, we talk a lot about the human machine uh, combination and most robots are an automata or and even artificial intelligence is based on the human. So I was really interested in this body of work to look at the human animal machine interface and to really think about what that means to bring that kind of materiality and, and sort of another species into this debate about technology and life. And I created this kind of neoprene surface. I wanted this um, work to be both sort of appealing and, and also a bit repellent. And in it, I was trying to give technology back its pelt. So in some ways, this idea of technology is naked. And when I look around at my desk here, all my, you know, my electronic equipment is a shiny, hard, cold surface. So this idea of, of really rethinking the kind of the materiality, not only of the technologies we use, but also the consequences of, um, of building some of these technologies, whether it's in terms of environmental concerns or, or actually the human labor that builds them. If we could go to the next slide. This work came out of a really interesting research trip I took many years ago to um, medical textile labs in Canada and the United States on the Eastern seaboard. And research has always been a really interesting and important part of my work. And I don't always know why I'm doing this. This just seemed like I really, I was all of a sudden fascinated. At that time, it was a, a early, I think it was 2002. It was spider silk was the latest kind of technology that was being developed. It was hoped that um, uh, an artificial spider silk could be produced that would become the strongest material in the world. So I actually learned a lot about spiders. I could talk a long time about them, about their drag, uh, their different um, nets and webs, but it was so interesting to go into these different research labs and see what was going on. And one of them I went to was in a lab that was doing a biomedical apparatus. And what you see on the bottom of the screen is various heart valves. Um, on the far left, it's mechanical. And on the far right, it's, um, those are porcine heart valves. And so there, there are heart valves that are taken from pigs. And then they are attached to a knit structure uh, that is hand knit and also has a purple suture line in it that is used for the uh, surgeons to then attach the porcine heart valve to, um, to well, the human, what was the human heart valve. And at that point, it got me really interested and fascinated into this human animal um, kind of companionship or not, in this case, I wouldn't say companionship, it's more use because of course, then I was saying, well, you know, you have to have farmers to farm all these animals for, you know, for human use. And, and so this idea that in many ways we are already hybrids um, in terms of human animal and, and many of us also machine because of different medical interventions. So part of, I think my interest in work is trying to make things that are already in the world kind of visible in ways that are hopefully engaging. I think too, I'm always also trying to make a claim for kind of the material world in which we live. If we could go to the next slide. So this piece is in the exhibition and it's called Pelt and it's very much in the form of kind of an animal pelt and I did have that, wanted to make that very both natural and unnatural material. And if you go to see it, it, it appears to almost breathe. It, it has movement on either side that is almost a bit like lungs. And so this idea of, of maybe thinking about our relationship to kind of other species, but also thinking about our, our um, uh, relationship to kind of technology. And in fact, of course, this sculpture is plugged in as well, although uh, ideally it's, it's hidden. And uh, maybe we can go to the next slide. I went in this project, uh, it's called Hybrid Bodies, and it's a project that I've been involved in for over 15 years. 
Um, and this is a real departure and you can also see it in the work. Most of my work tends to be very materially rich and hopefully very sensorial. And this project uh, was based at the Monk Center, in, the Cardiac Center in Toronto, um, Canada. And four artists, two from the UK and two from Canada were invited to look at research into the non-medical effects of transplant in recipients. And this was a, a fascinating multi-year project. And it was in a way such a luxury to have, to be able to have a multi-year project, you know, because usually you, you might be invited into a project and then you leave. It took a long time to gain trust. And apparently the traditional quality of life assessments for heart transplant success and, and recipients is based on, on questionnaires. And this team, interdisciplinary team, of philosophers, cardiologists, nurses, sociologists, and artists decided to look at gesture. And when I was able to see these incredible videos and saw that it, they were, what they said was definitely at odds with their movements and their gestures were so kind of invested and, um, and moving that I decided I wanted to go out of my comfort zone, partly because I felt the chief cardiologist had gone on such uh, uh, um, gone out on such a limb to work on this project. She's a hard qualitative researcher, scientist, surgeon, and to work with artists, to work with the humanities on this. And so I worked with two dancers. And if you could play the video, just a little bit of it. I worked with two dancers to really explore some of the ideas and everything in transplant um, is really about a dyad. It's about the donor, the recipient, the body needing the heart, the body rejecting the heart. It's, it's a very complex um, thing. And so I really worked with these dancers and tried to tell, to get some of these very things like this importance of also the weight of, of guilt that many people feel for receiving it. Um, also, the fear of once a transplant has happened, uh, recipients' immune systems are incredibly compromised. So this idea of fear of being in the world of touching anyone or touching things a little bit like what we, I think, experience now in COVID. The last thing about say about this piece is that it was um, the experience of transplant is very internal. It's not visible. You Recipients will have a scar, which they can hide or show. But really, they've undergone um, this process, and then it's not visible. And so that was partly why I wanted to work with the idea of movement and something that was in time. Could we go to the next slide? Another component was two sound pieces, uh, sound work that I also tend to like to work with sound. And you can see again, I was very interested in having this material surface. The next slide, please. Um, these are transducers, which are often used in hearing aids, and they conduct sound not through your outer ear, but through your inner and middle ear and use the bones of your skull as a conducting means and sort of your skull as a resonating chamber. I took various um, statements from recipients' experiences and had various friends read them. And uh, so I had a whole range of voices, but not professional actors' voices. It was really important that these were um, people that people might recognize and it the piece is actually in five languages and so you hold this transducer to I like it I hear the sound best on my forehead maybe on some other people on the chin and also it's a very intimate way of hearing these really compelling stories you hear it inside your body only you can hear it no one else um, so maybe we'll go to the next slide the second half of oh never mind um, this was a project I think there was a video next, but if not, not to worry. No, we'll go with it. I've got confused with my own order. Um, this was an exhibition that I was invited to be in and a project along with Sean. So it's kind of lovely to see him again and to be speaking with him tonight, which calls Flux and it was called See Me, Hear Me, Touch Me. I, I'm sorry, I think I have it, the title a little bit incorrect. And it was at, based at the University of Alberta, which is in Edmonton, Canada. And it was a group of, um, uh, doctors and dentists looking at the effects of head and neck cancer in patients. And this project was very different because after head and neck surgery, often including a tracheotomy, 
there's incredibly um, changes in the in in the face and neck region. So it's a very visible and and very public um, view of of what's happened. So in all of these, both of these projects, there's a kind of an emotional energy that is there and that is actually really exhausting and, and kind of wonderful. And, um, but in this way, I decided to work directly with clay. In this one, um, this, the next one we'll go to. <clears throat> well, the one up, okay, if we can go back, sorry, Casey, I'm the worst. The piece on the right is uh, part of a, um, a neck and throat. And there's a red balloon that gradually inflates and deflates. And so it was kind of about this dislocation of the voice. The next one is a sculpture and inside it's a, a large clay. I hate to say it, it's almost a blob. And inside is uh, the sound of someone laughing. And you can really only hear it when you go close to it. And that was probably one of the saddest things for me was that many people after, most people after head and neck, um, cancer surgery can no longer laugh. Um, so next slide. And a couple of drawings. Drawing is also a big part of the practice um, in terms of both thinking about work beforehand and also having a companion work along the way as some of these works take a very long time to make. So drawing is a very um, engaging and quick way of working through ideas. Next slide. Could we have the next slide? I won't go too much into this one. I think I'm getting out of time. This was the second part of the hybrid bodies project, which looked at the effect yeah. of um, transplant on donor recipients. And, and so in this case in Canada, a donor um, procurement and receiving is, is anonymous. And so recipients are encouraged to write letters. You can run the video, Casey, are encouraged to write letters um, to the recipient or to the donor oh, family, boy, but yeah. those letters are vetted by the okay. organ procurement agency, which is, is run by provincial our version of states. Right. And so letters are written, but then they are incredibly redacted before they go. So I tried to imagine myself as someone who had lost a child and um, writing a letter and then to have it eventually redacted to have really nothing left in it. Um, and in this project, we did actually have bring about some change in, um, in, in how things are perceived in Canada. Anyway, if we can go to the next one. <coughs> and this is the piece I worked on for um, the Spencer Museum and it was a commission and I'm so fortunate to have been able to work on this. The piece is called Embrace and it's in two parts. And in this work, I was really interested in the idea of, especially because the piece was made well before and during COVID when touch between, between individuals became almost impossible, except if you were living with someone. And so that just how great that loss of touch was. So I wanted to kind of use materials and sound almost as a field to kind of create a sense of touch. So it was a sense not so much of of, of an image, but to kind of create a space. And I, I don't have the sound for it, um, but it's, uh, it was done with a pentatonic glockenspiel, which is, I actually have it behind me. It's just a small, a very beautiful little instrument of wood and brass that you can tap with uh, wood or rubber mallets. And it creates a very pure, beautiful tone. And it's used often to teach music and for, to introduce babies and children to music. And the unique thing about this is that it doesn't have any dissonance. So anything you can do will sound good. If we can go to the next slide. Um, so these speakers are embroidered out of copper and conductive thread using this incredible machine I had access to called the Tajim. And I think we have a slide of it coming up maybe. Um, and maybe we'll go to the video, if you don't mind, which is like the next one. And so, with this machine, I was able to embroider these speakers. You, um, and it works very much like a, a basic speaker. You have to have a spiral. Um, you have to have two ends, one that goes to an input and output. There's a magnet that's put behind it um, so that there's resonance. Um, 
Oh, maybe we can go back to the installation shots, if you don't mind, Casey. Um, and so these copper, the choices of the materials was really, really important. I wanted the material of felt, which is, it's been used in as both uh, an insulator and a conductor. Um, it's been used as housing, nomadic housing, it's used in clothing. Copper has long associations with healing. And so it was, um, the, those choice of materials were very, very important. And so as these play, there is a kind of resonance to them and they actually vibrate and shimmer. Um, there's, uh, there's another part of the piece too, which is the, the wall part. Of, and you can see it at the back, which is also felt a very large, um, sort of the largest, the height is 16 foot of the talls, which is also industrial felt much thicker. And it has the felt, the speakers, uh, in this case, they are commercial speakers that I attached um, in there. And the sound has a different resonance. And so I kind of wanted these pieces to kind of maybe sort of speak to each other in a way that we have that removed. Um, I also wanted the, you know, maybe the, the viewer to feel like they could be envelop those things to it. Um, I think, um, I think that that might be it. I think I'm out of time. So maybe we'll look at this one. This is actually just shows um, how the sound works. Sorry, I'm having a hard okay, time don't worry. seeing That's... where the, the play button is. I think it got cut off on my screen. Um... That's all right. On the inquiry Sorry. page, no, on the inquiry page, there's a whole, there's a couple of videos there about the making of the project. And so again, that real idea of really using um, a whole variety of materials to kind of hopefully create an embodied experience and to really engage and reach out to the viewer. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to turn over the, uh, the floor to Sean. All right, thanks uh, Ingrid. And that was a terrific talk. Great to see the work. Uh, so I'll just dive in. I do wanna also start with a uh, thank you. Um, the Spencer Museum looks like an amazing space and that looks like a wonderful exhibition and I'm really honored and pleased to be part of it. So thanks for that. I'm gonna talk briefly about how uh, my piece, The Anatomy Table came to be. Um, and it started from a larger interdisciplinary project. So similar to how Ingrid has been working. Uh, and it was called Immunations. Uh, and Immunations was started by uh, a professor, Stephen Hoffman, who's a, a professor of global health and uh, political science at York University. And he brought together a interdisciplinary team. And here's the um, kind of a group shop, shop, shot of the team uh, to look at the questions of vaccines. Uh, and at the time, I mean, vaccines are always so important for in relation to health, but we didn't realize how <laughs> big a topic it would soon become. Uh, at any rate, the, this is an image of the group. And again, like had, how Ingrid had been working, it was a group of uh, artists, creative researchers, but also people in biomedicine, uh, philosophers, global health, that sort of thing. And I'll just note that this shot was taken outside of UNAIDS the exhibition eventually ended up in a number of places, but UNAIDS was one of the places in Geneva where the uh, exhibition uh, sort of happened. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Next slide. So I do, uh, there, this is, I recognize small type. And if you're interested in learning more about the project, uh, do visit Immunations. Uh, uh, we have a website and you can sort of dive into it more. I just wanted to show this because I wanted to note uh, another colleague's uh, role in this, Natalie Loveless. Uh, she's a colleague with me at the University of Alberta and she was the curator for the project. So important role. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk about my piece, but I, before I get into mine, I did wanna just very briefly talk about two pieces that were part of the project. Uh, this first one is um, conversation with vaccine critical parents. And it was uh, by, Kaisu Koshki with, uh, in collaboration with Joanna Holst. Who, Joanna Holst, uh, Kaisu is an artist and Joanna Holst works in the uh, field of vaccines. And for this piece, um, Kaisu interviewed vaccine hesitant parents uh, on the one hand. And then on the other hand, she interviewed doctors. 
And the goal of the project was really to kind of look at this question of why do people make choices around vaccines the way they do. Um, so it's a very interesting project, obviously very timely. Uh, it's a super important issue right now. And to my mind, it's a great example of the ways research, what we might consider research in other disciplines, like for example, the sciences, can come together with creative practice to produce kind of new knowledge. Next, next slide. So, I mean, this was a complex and interesting project and I could go on about it a, a lot, but I do think one of the things I wanted to underscore is be, because it has this sort of uh, creative side, in other words, makes use of poetic language, metaphor, that sort of thing. I do think it brought insights into why people were making certain choices that maybe wouldn't have come about otherwise. Uh, and this is a great uh, example. This is a wonderful still from the video and you know, uh, this wonderful image of this child coming, crawling off the screen and then this sort of powerful text. Next slide. Another, uh, another still from the, uh, from the video. So to be clear though, I wanna be crystal, crystal clear that the work was not about uh, promoting vaccine hesitancy. Uh, it was about asking the question of why this happens. And, I, and, and, and in this sense, I think it can contribute to broader discussions around this really complex and difficult subject. Next slide. Another uh, uh, work that was part of the project was called Shadowpox. And it had, again, it was a collaborative project itself. Caitlin Fisher, Alison Humphrey, Stephen Hoffman was involved in this one. And for this project, uh, Allison came up with this kind of idea of inventing a pandemic um, and it was called Shadowpox. And so the piece unfolded uh, by people, participants entering into a kind of interactive uh, game really where shadows were projected onto that were this kind of, uh, well, pandemic. And you could kind of interact with the shadows and try to pull them off. Um, what was so that alone was really fascinating, but what was really even more interesting was that uh, before entering the, the kind of interactive piece, you could make choices. You could choose to be vaccinated or not vaccinated. You could choose uh, what part of the world you were from. And those choices would result in the shadow pox affecting you in different ways and also affecting the community you lived in in different ways. So again, a great example of of the ways creative practice and then different kinds of research could come together to produce uh, knowledge and to you know inter interact with communities in different ways. Next slide. Uh, so this is a still from the uh, from the project, and I think important to note uh, too that it's just you know beyond the kind of interesting knowledge that's produced, they're compelling it, images in their own right too. So next slide. So for my part in this project, I, I produced the anatomy table. And uh, again, working in a collaborative team, uh, I would like to note my brother, Timothy Caulfield, who is also a professor at the university I work at in the field of health law. Uh, and Johan Holst again worked on this project. Next slide. So as someone who's interested in printmaking and the history of print and the history of uh, medical illustration, I started my kind of piece by looking at this famous, uh, Vesalius's famous work on the fabric of the human body from the 16th century. And for me, it was, a, it was an interesting starting point because I saw it as a, one example, certainly not the only one, but one example of a, a kind of an early exploration into in, you know, looking at the body in a, with a kind of empirical lens. Uh, so I, I started with this, and we'll go to the next slide. And I appropriated the Vesalius, uh, began to kind of manipulate it digitally. And then over top, I began to make kind of my own drawings. So drawings that reference anatomy, that reference the body, but that had a kind of invented, whimsical, absurd quality to them. Next slide. So these first two images are sort of studies I, uh, I, was, I did for the, um, the larger piece. Uh, and they're done on drafting film and rag paper. And I created them in a way that they could be kind of peeled apart. So I was referencing there some of those old anatomical texts where you could actually sort of peel apart the body and look at different systems in the body. Next slide. In the end, I, I produced a full uh, figure. And uh, you know, lots of questions I hope come up in the piece, but one of the primary ones I think I was, I was thinking about was this question of how do we know the body, right? Uh, 
There's of course the lens of science, which is incredibly important, but there's other ways that we know the body. And, you know, I guess Ingrid already touched on this. Uh, illness is a good example. You can understand illness from the scientific perspective, but there's a very different kind of uh, perspective living uh, through illness, right? And these, these kinds of ways of knowing the body can, can be in, in tension with one another, of, of course. Um, and this can lead to problems and in relation to things like vaccination, right? Uh, next slide. Uh, in producing the work, uh, the bigger project, we had a number of workshops. So the interdisciplinary group would get together and meet at various times. And in, in one of the meetings, we went to the UN AIDS building we knew we were gonna have an exhibition there. And uh, these, these beautiful windows are part of the architecture there. So I partly uh, designed the inanimate table in response to that, uh, that space. And this is part of why I arrived at a grid. Next slide. A few details. Uh, these are sort of the side panels. I also uh, made the kind of grid shape because I also wanted to uh, reference uh, anatomical text. So a, a book work, next slide. Another detail, next slide. Uh, here's another view of the piece uh, in a different um, kind of venue. And you can just sort of see how the piece changes uh, in relationship to light. All of, the, uh, all of the front panel is printed on a transparent film and then there's this kind of rag or digital paper behind. So light has a big impact on how you can read it. Next slide. And then uh, wonderful to see this, I just, got this today, I'm, I'm thrilled to see it uh, at the Spencer Museum, how it's been placed. And this is a great image because you can sense uh, on the pieces on the wall, the way the drafting film is kind of coming up off the wall. And that's precisely how I wanted the piece to read. So again, there's that reference to an artist book or, or a hist uh, historical textbook. Uh, and then there's also this kind of light quality to the, to the paper. Uh, and I think I have one more. So the last thing I wanted to say before we get into discussion is just to go back to the UN AIDS uh, building is the exhibition um, actually happened in conjunction with a global health uh, conference. So for me, this was, was great and important to note and uh, uh, an example of how, you know, creative projects can reach out to different communities and, and kind of interact with communities. And I think as, you know, as artists, it's 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 good to challenge uh, challenge our practices and try to reach out in different ways. This is not to say, I mean, I love museums and galleries, and we don't want to lose those for sure. But alongside those kinds of spaces, to look at alternative spaces to reach out uh, to various communities. So I think that's it. I'll end there. Sean, did you want to mention your current project? Oh, <laughs> thank you for that reminder. I asked you about it. Uh, so I did uh, want to mention, yes, right now I'm, I just finished a, a, a website that's a kind of online um, exhibition, creative performance space uh, dedicated to work that is exploring COVID-19 as a theme. So the work is either like exploring it as a theme or exploring it in relationship to how creative practices have had to change as response to COVID-19. So please visit that. You, you can see that at um, www.covidcreative.ca. Uh, and I think, you know, there's some interesting work there that is about responding to a pandemic. Thanks for that reminder, Casey. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sean. And thank you, Ingrid. Um, this is normally the, the part where we would all use our bodies to <laughs> applaud, but if everyone just wants to give Ingrid and Sean some some snaps. Um, this was so great. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to learn more about your work. Um, before we, we sort of start our conversation, I did just want to let everyone know that our next event in the Body Matters um, series will be taking place in two weeks on March 23rd at 530 with um, Metal Smith's Holland Hudak and KU's very own Gina Westergaard. So uh, you can register for that at our website. Um, but now I'm really excited to, um, to have some conversations with you, Sean and Ingrid. I'm going to stop my screen share so that we can all come back and be together. Um, and I, you know, I'm sure that you all want to ask questions and have conversations with each other, but I thought maybe I would just get us started um, with a question that I have. Um, 
you know, part of my impetus in starting this exhibition was to, or creating this exhibition was to um, meet with artists who are working at the intersections of art and medicine. Um, and there's been a lot of sort of question or skepticism, especially from those in the medical and scientific communities about what contributions art and artists can make to the field. Um, and both of you have worked extensively across disciplines and with medical practitioners. So just to get the conversation started, could you speak to how your work um, as an artist has resulted in measurable changes um, to sort of medical training or practice? Sure. Um, although I will have to say that it's a two-way street, and that's, of course, one of the wonderful things about doing um, cross-disciplinary exchange. They're intensely difficult and humbling because you really come up against your own biases, which is rather disturbing when you think you don't have as many as you do. Um, in the hybrid bodies, the first part, which was dealing with um, recipients, her organ recipients, uh, the, the medical team changed how they approached patients pre and post transplant after, after the project, um, because they felt that there was always the idea of it's, you know, the heart's a pump, it's, it's a machine, it's, and yet the, um, you know, to encourage organ donation, it's always the miracle of life, you're giving life. So there's a lot of conflict in a lot of recipients. So they definitely changed how they uh, approached patients before and after. They also approached, uh, changed how they approached during research um, and particularly about quality of life assessments. And they went from not only doing paper assessments, but also video interviews and really including body language, um, voice, timbre. And one of their, their most popular, popular sort of sayings that everyone says is I'm great and it sounds on paper I'm great but you know if someone says I'm great you know it's 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 very different um it, with the second part of the project because uh, organ donation is anonymous in Canada and it causes a lot of conflict for some people and not for all so there is a bit of an effort to have possibly a registry set up that's a little bit like a registry that you would have for adoption where both parties would have to be willing that's still not underway, but it was really good that the, um, we co-authored a paper that was presented at the International Heart and Lung Transplantation Conference two years ago, uh, particularly addressing this. So maybe to build on some of that, uh, I guess a few things I would say is the, I think I alluded in my presentation to some questions around vaccine hesitancy. And I think some of the creative, creative projects that were undertaken as part of Immunations uh, did result in some strategies, maybe around listening, around uh, better ways to communicate, um, sensitivity. So I think that's one example, and we can dive into that more if people want. Another is the project uh, Ingrid mentioned, Flux resp uh, responding to head and neck cancer where I felt there was a strong uh, kind of understanding and awareness built around uh, people who had undergone that sort of treatment, not wanting to shy away from difficult images, not wanting to shy away from the hard experiences they had lived and, and maybe not wanting to be kind of sheltered as much, if I could put it in that term, if, if you think that's the right way to say it, Ingrid. I so, think it's absolutely true. Yeah really yeah. important point. They didn't want the saccharine, like beautiful flowers in a field images. They wanted their pain to yeah. be expressed, their experiences. Yeah. The final thing I do want to say though, which is always an important point for me personally, is what as, as much as these collaborations result in these impacts that are measurable, I also really want to state the importance of kind of the value of art production in its own right. And that, that this is paramount to remember in the big sense, because of course, what art does is foster complex thinking, nuanced thinking. And this in the big sense is incredibly impactful, right? And we, you know, we can't, can't forget that side to it too, I think. That's great. We do have a few questions. Um in the chat and um, Ashley, I'm going to get to your question, but Joey or um, 
kind of posed a question that I think gets to this point, Sean, about art making. So I think let's let's jump in with that. Um, Joey says, I wonder if either of you has um, used methods from medical practitioners in their art making or as a result of collaborative exchange. And Joey, feel free to unmute and jump in if you want to elaborate more. Hey, oh gosh, you didn't really want me to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> what have I done? Um, yeah, sorry, I meant to unmute. Um, yeah, so I guess I'm just curious, you know, um, in conversation with medical practitioners, are they actually doing things, you know, method in an unfancy term, what one does to achieve one's work that you're taking from them and actually, I mean, you know, Ingrid, you said, you know, you're so interested in making, you know, exploring the materiality of things. So is there a way in which what uh, medical practitioners are doing is actually being adopted in artistic practice? I don't know if it's exactly what they're doing, but certainly how they approach. I mean, I have gathered a lot of respect for quantitative research and the rigor and the discipline of it, like how much, and of course it's impossible. And I think having a long history of looking at medical illustrations, a history of them, we know that, but just the rigor that that demands of a medical team. Also what demands that they have to look at everyone and they do, or they really try to individually as a human being without regard of, of class or race or ethnicity. Now, of course, there are obvious flaws in that, but there still, there still is that ideal that they are sort of, they have been trained towards. And so I also think I, I questioned um, my notion of artistic license, which has always been the, th the throw all, like forgive everything. And especially when dealing with human uh, experiences, um, that would be, I have to admit there is some equipment that I would like to work with, that I did see, especially when I went to the KU Medical Center a couple of years ago. Some of the imaging technology, of course, um, was pretty fantastic. But that, that's a little di a different point than your question. Yeah, I, I, what Ingrid was just saying there at the end kind of leads to where I was thinking in that, um, you know, the history of anatomical illustration is, is so fascinating. and. It's something that I draw on a lot and just even being with that work to me is just like, it's incredible on so many levels. Technically it's incredible, but the way they kind of look at the world is, is really interesting to, to kind of be with. And then what I wanted to share was my colleague, Marilyn Oliver, uh, who actually uses CT scans, MRI scans to produce images. So I think this is what Ingrid was alluding to is there's a lot of artists now doing this actually using the technology of, of uh, science and, and re, re, re kind of thinking it in, in new terms, right? And the result of course is it, again, new knowledge, I think new insights into what this technology means to us, right? Well, there was a project that uh, Carbo uh, Farman Cavallo did around breast cancer, and they were using 3D printers to actually model the breast cancers themselves. and they then, those sort of became artifacts, which is something that became really important um, in a lot of this is the kind of artifacts that people need, many people need to kind of have a recognition that they've gone through something. And we are kind of in a secular age, although we're not, but it's, we, there's not a lot of shared rights. And, but what was interesting in that, that the hospital then uh, in New York bought a 3D printer to understand um, the nature of, of uh, of these tumors. Well, and I think this, this connection between sort of bodily experience um, and art making and materials that, Ashley, um, I don't know if you wanna unmute and jump in, but I can read your comment. Um, I think she was starting to get at some of these issues. She says, I enjoyed hearing about your various material choices. And I wonder if you could speak more to how you might see artistic materials relating to how we bodily interact with works of art, either physically or in our imagination? That's a tough question. <laughs> uh, can you, do, do you mean like, how does art materials make us rethink our bodies? Um, 
I feel like it's open to interpreting it that way. Okay. I I think a lot about material practice, material use in my own research. And I feel like with this exhibition, with this focus on the body and depicting the body that when we either walk through the exhibition, if we're lucky enough to do so, or in the virtual exhibition, our brains, our eyes are transmitting these messages about what it's like to experience them. I think of your pelt, for instance, Ingrid, which you know has this real tactile quality to it. And I suppose I was just thinking about the ways in which artistic uh, materials evoke bodily responses, wow. even if we yeah. can't touch them. Well, I, that's what I'm hoping for, because I think, I mean, COVID has had a huge impact, I think probably John would agree on, on how artists practice. Like, I think we're gonna be in a new, um, we're in a new world. And one where, I mean, the original piece I was going to show was a piece where you had to touch the ones with the transducer, that's not loud. So I guess for me, one of the things, you know, as someone who's very invested in materials in the material world is to kind of, how can I make, well, I don't quite know what I'm gonna do. I'm either gonna go really local and maybe do site specific work in my community, but I also want to see if I can maybe translate some of the materiality of the pieces, even if it's seen on a digital way, that you feel the maybe the loss of the material, that you feel almost like a synesthetic kind of sense of touch. And so it's a really great question. And it's I think it's one that um, I think we're all grappling with. I don't know if that answers, but. Uh... Yeah, and maybe just it got me thinking too about the ways that a artist's body interacts with materials then in turn makes you think about your own body, if that makes sense. Uh, the way the artist had to stretch or bend or that can have of course traces on a piece, right? And can really be, I think, profound uh, in, in terms of making you rethink your own sense of self, right? I think it's such a great question because touch is so, like we have such a language for visual and for hearing. We, we have a little bit for touch, rough, smooth, but it's so complex and, and kind of the whole, that whole combination of senses. I'm really, yeah, I'm really, I'm actually working on that now, really trying to think about how to think of that both in terms of the digital sphere, which where so much of my life now happens, but also in, you know, the world and community in which I live too. Well, and I, I just wanted to share some observations from having been in the physical exhibition space that I have both had and have observed people having sort of physical reactions to works, um, you know, whether that's looking at some of the anatomical illustrations and kind of moving away from them or touching the body part that's depicted as something I've seen a lot. So there's um, two prints by um, Borgery that show sort of eyeballs in various states of dissection and people will kind of go like this. Um, Sean, everyone wants to lift up the shot. <laughs> I'm sure if we have collection manage managers uh, from the Spencer here, they'll understand, but people do want to interact with it that way. And Ingrid, I, um, our, our security team who relays so much about how visitors are experiencing exhibitions shared that, um, the two the embrace the two sort of sound pieces you have a lot of people think that they are causing the sounds by virtue of their proximity or movements so i've seen people stand kind of waving or like wanting to touch it um, and so there has been i think this real attention to visitors and audiences sort of own bodily experiences and subjectivities as they're they're looking at these works of art um, you know, and Ingrid Great. definitely thinking yeah. about how some of your pelts do respond to, to movement mm -hmm. and proximity. Um, I think that's, that's really interesting. Um, we have another really great question um, from Terry Kennedy and she's over at the School of Nursing at the um, Medical Center. Um, and Terry, please feel free to unmute and jump in um, if you want, but your question is, uh, I just lost it. <laughs> Can you discuss art as research is a serious research endeavor and how you've worked um, with institutional review boards to increase their understanding of the importance of human subject reviews to this work. You wanna tackle that one? <laughs> <laughs> sure. The big one, yeah. Uh, no, I'll, I'll... You start though and I'll... Um, well, I guess just to clarify, do you mean how do we 
talk about artistic practice in like peer review situations or that... so I'll, I'll contextualize it yeah. so we have a um a relatively new um health humanities and arts research collaborative and one of my colleagues is on the call and um we uh had a recent conversation um we're partnering with our folks who who are you know kind of the research arm for the university with the biomedical side of life and one of the conversations was around how sometimes when artistic research projects are presented to institutional review boards, um, they're not treated as, as serious in mm -hmm. the sense of that they can have an impact on human subjects. And your, uh, both of your presentations has really put that in such focus, how, what the potential is of these health humanities and arts research collaborations. Um, so I just wondered, and, and I think one of you mentioned that you had someone who was, um, um, you know, brave in uh, proposing this kind of work. So I wanted to just sort of ask, how have you navigated that terrain? How have you explained the importance of the work that it's take, it, it's important to have a serious review of it from a research perspective? Um, so that you know, it, it the university or the organizations are embracing that. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, a couple of thoughts, and then I'll pass it to Ingrid. Uh, I guess one of the things I do think, uh, you know, like other uh, research endeavors, that pointing to examples can be super helpful, right? And both, you know, contemporary ones, but historic ones, right? Where there's lots of evidence that this kind of collaboration leads to knowledge, and you know. The history of anatomical illustration is a good, a good one. So that maybe would be one suggestion. The other is, I think sometimes the other, other disciplines don't recognize peer review process that exists in the arts and outlining those. And, you know, I've been in interdisciplinary discussions and they're like, oh, I didn't realize a lot of the peer thing, review things you do, we do too, you do it a little differently, but these structures exist. And I think that can help. Uh, finally, I would say that um, I, I do know, you know, we, we were fortunate to get funding, uh, the immunations, actually we got funding from the Research Council of Norway for a lot of it. And there was skepticism for sure from that group, like, and skepticism right up. But I'll tell you what, the first exhibition <laughs> just dissipated. So what am I saying there? I think there's a, I mean, I know that's not helpful, but there was a kind of trust thing for a while and, and Boy, opinions changed very quickly once the, the product happened. So I don't know if that's helpful or not. Well, I might just add too that I feel that one of the things I've had to do is, um, you know, always say, you know, a, an ex a juried exhibition is like a peer reviewed article. Um, a feature length film is like a, a book, um, peer reviewed book. Uh, uh, a substantial exhibition in a gallery or museum with multiple works is also equivalent. And so that idea of equivalencies, and I think the fact that, you know, our, we have a lot more commonalities than um, we actually know. It was really interesting with the hybrid bodies project in the beginning years, we had such difficulty getting funded because we applied as a complete interdisciplinary team to our medical funder, CHIR, and to SHIRT. And which is our social sciences and humanities. And we were two, one said, oh, you should go to SHRC. The other said, you should go to CHIR. When we divided up our research, which was grant, which was counter to our intent, we got our first funding. And of course it was a bit problematic because the artists got funded first and the social scientists. So the medical people were like really, it, it was, I mean, with such great conversations about everything. Fortunately, the next grant, which was also a shirk, was funded um, by both uh, by both councils. But it's only now I just noticed that there's a Trillium Fund, which is actually for art science projects. So 14 years after our project started, now there, there's actually real interest in doing this. And I think the idea is it's this recognition that artists are not scientists and don't want to be scientists. We have our own research ways of doing things and observing. And our, our field is not like, like qualitative knowledge that is truth-based. It's about 
looking at knowledge and trying to share it and, and see and, and put it in a venue where people can discuss it. So I think it becomes a really, the arts become a really important forum. And I think Sean, your, your vaccination work was really critical in that about issues that, um, I mean, people are less, I mean, sometimes they're intimidated by it, but they're more likely to give an opinion about it and to speak about it. So it has this potential to be a forum to talk about these ideas. Thank you. I feel like this is a whole whole other topic too. There's some some chats happening now about artistic research and review. Um, but Rachel um, had a really great question that I think speaks to the ways that both of you have engaged in sort of qualitative and social science based research. Um, so Rachel, do you want to jump in and and ask what's on your mind and. Uh, Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Casey. Um, yeah. So with Casey's initial question, like something that I heard both of you talk about with flux and then with hybrid bodies is the way that um, th the disconnect between like how um, treatment recipients or patients were feeling and how the medical professionals were interpreting their feelings. So like with hybrid bodies, like the, um, the fact that body language is not being included in the, those assessments. And then with flux, like the um, kind of like coddling that happened to the um, recovered um, folks receiving cancer treatment. So I'm really interested in, and I think like a lot of the exhibition is dealing with this, but I'm really interested in how like art's role in kind of bridging that gap or, or maybe just acknowledging it. And would, would like to hear both of you talk about what you think that role is and, um, kind of how it, it manifests and uh, plays out like in the medical community. Ooh. Well, I, you go first. Okay. <laughs> okay. Again, another good, good, but tough question. Um, I get, you know, one thing I do want to say in, in relationship to flux is I certainly understand why the healthcare professionals were being sensitive. Like, I want to be really respectful. It's, boy, that's a difficult situation. And I, so I don't mean any judgment by that. It just was interesting to see after we sort of started to produce work that the patients actually preferred the work that was harder to kind of be with. And uh, that was very interesting. And so again, just to be sensitive to the tough position, a lot of those healthcare uh, professionals are in. Uh, but to maybe get to your question a little bit, um, I suppose part this is maybe the, the value that the creative practice has, can have because we were listening to their experiences in a, in a sense from a different perspective. It wasn't so much about treatment, right? And it was about a, maybe a kind of different listening. I know that sounds very mystical <laughs> and I don't mean it that way, but so as a result, I don't think there was the same kind of pressures for outcome that maybe so someone else having to think about treatment is experiencing. So again, I mean, the treatment is, is vital. I mean, I don't, again, and anyone want to downplay that, but maybe that, that was the kind of uh, way in that was different. Ingrid, I don't know if I'm making any sense or not. You are, and I think it's really, yeah. um, I think it's, a, it's a, a, a really good question. I also, um, I thought, you know, nurses were so important, um, certainly in hybrid bodies, because they were the ones who first noticed the kind of distress that recipients were having in clinic. And so that was so interesting too, just in terms of hierarchies of listening and knowledge. Um, and things like that. I think arts can play such an interesting role. I think they're, I mean, I think because it's not about medical illustration, it's not about therapy, both which are really, really important fields. But I think it's about kind of looking at some of these issues that are actually social and cultural. Like, how do we think of death? Like heart transplant meant that in, in Canada and most countries, the definition of death had to be redefined, you know, without really much public, discussion. So it's no longer heart death, the heart stopping, it's brain death. So these are things that we, we don't realize and in some ways in sci-fi and in um, kind of like National Enquirer magazines, like you get actually some of those questions being looked at in, in often really cheesy ways, but often really interesting ways. And so I think the ideas of, of maybe look at what artists do 
that is informed by the research that's uh, uh, by their the medical partners is that it's a way of looking at it and sort of putting it out in a in a public forum that isn't um, going to have a, hopefully a negative impact on anyone's life. But let's people discuss these ideas. Like it really becomes a campfire around which we can discuss some of these really important ideas about what constitutes life and death and who, I mean, also those things are, are really you know, particular. So I don't know if that answered your question, but I do think that's the, re the real kind of key. And it's, it's kind of what art is to do anyway. And I think the strength of any real art medical collab or science collaboration is when everyone does what they want to do, what they do best, and that they're kind of bound by kind of shared questions. Thank you. Yeah, we, we had some, we've had some really big questions um, get asked in the chat. And there are still a few more, but I do want to respect um, time. So if anyone wants to exit right now, um, Please, thank you so much for coming. I hope to see you again in a few weeks. But Sean and Ingrid, would you be willing to stick on for just mm -hmm. a couple of minutes to, oh, sure. no, to follow sure. up? Yeah. Great. And if anyone wants to stay, please feel free. But I do, I realize people maybe want to go grab dinner or <laughs> I guess the sun has already set. Um, but Katie, um, or Catherine, <laughs> uh, Katie Ryan, who's a, one of my close colleagues and a medical anthropologist, um, had a, a question that's building on, I think, what you were just speaking about, Sean and Ingrid. Katie, do you want to jump in here? Are you still, are you still on? Um, we, first I come both because I love this topic and questions and I have been involved in Terry's work with Hark and with Casey's work with another project. But um, I'm also here because I have several students from my class called Culture and Health here today. And um, we were talking, especially in class, and they were reflecting on these kinds of divides we have set up in, especially in American society that puts science on one hand and empiricism or empirical work on one hand and arts or culture or emotion on the other. And they were reflecting, especially on Sean's work about how your work really pushes back against those divides and tries to trouble them. And I think you've given so many good examples today in the discussion about how everything from the methodologies and materials that you work with and artists work with more broadly and methods and um, the ethics you employ to, um, to even the forms of peer review that take place show that you are very much in, in the trenches with the sciences and, and challenging and pushing back against them. But I wondered if, I wondered if some of the, I wondered how the projects that you've been involved in may have actually transformed the work that these uh, clinicians have engaged in in some ways, or do you know about how has it changed how medical practice is done in a way that takes emotion and creativity and materiality um, as seriously as you do. Um, should, I, should I go, Ingrid, or? Sure. OK. Um, so maybe, you know, actually, I, I, as you were talking, I, I uh, answer for, by giving another project. I just finished a project with my brother, which is an artist book that's about the ways uh, of fighting misinformation in relationship to COVID-19. Oh. So, you know, the huge problem, right? Social media, we share constantly and we share too soon without thinking. So my brother and I just kind of came together and then another uh, designer, Sue Kohlberg, and we thought about this problem and I don't know if it's had impact yet, but I, it to me is a, an example the potential art can have um, because part of the challenge is slowing people down, right? Mm -hmm. And getting people to think, but there's this paradox at the same time in that we have to respond immediately. And anyway, in the project, we try to look at that question and it, it's, it's not an easy question to answer. And, um, but I guess I'm just offering uh, it as maybe a, a, another, yet another example of the way art can deal with a really tough and complex problem and as Ingrid's alluding to, foster discussion, get people to slow down and think in complex ways. So that's kind of an answer, not a very good one. But... Yeah. 
No. No, it's interesting. And I, I, I think too, what you're talking about, I mean, there's not only the arts and the sciences, but it was really interesting that our, um, the chief transplant psychiatrist uh, almost went to art school. So it's really <laughs> talented in drawing. The ca chief cardiologist is an incredibly accomplished musician, saxophone player and singer. Um, so many of the, uh, of the people we're working with have a real interest and in actually active engagement in the arts. There definitely was the hierarchy. And then I think, but I really felt, you know, I feel that there's this hierarchy um, just within my own practice. Like I have a commercial gallery um, God bless them, you know, my work isn't terribly commercial. Um, but you know, this kind of, my, my collaborative science research program isn't really of interest to them. And so I feel a bit like I'm split. So I feel like I have a career that is really these art science, then there is my uh, sculpture and kinetic work, and then there's some writing. And so, and it's really interesting where these things will get funded or not? Will they get shown? We had so much trouble getting the hybrid bodies first shown and we really had to rely on this wonderful friend who is uh, Cheryl Sim, who's a curator at the Phi Center who said, sounds great, go for it and basically let us have it. And so the number of our rejections over the years has been phenomenal as well as the number of our successes. But so it feels like there still are, even like within the arts, there are a lot of divides let alone between the arts. But I do feel like, and I think Sean alluded to this earlier, like I think of Albrecht Dürer, like he was also a mathematician. He designed, um, you know, the, the letters, the alphabet of geometry, obviously Leonardo, like there's this whole kind of sense. And I think that if it, it's, you know, it's about knowing kind of what you do within your field and how you go there. It is a um, <laughs> I, it's a continuing discussion though and I'm really happy to see it coming and I have a couple of students now who are working between art and medicine on projects in just really really interesting way one about obesity and another on uh, multiple sclerosis and um, so I feel that this is a really interesting moment I think this exhibition is really timely because I think it really shows what you know that art can have a much larger role than maybe you know decoration for walls, which is also nice too, but. Uh... Well, and that's what I was actually thinking too, because Ingrid, you know, when, when I first learned about the hybrid bodies, um, you know, and how th this disconnect between body language and nonverbal communication and what people were saying, I mean, someone who was trained in anthropology, it's like kind of, it was almost shocking to me that physicians didn't see it, but there's of course all of these reasons why they didn't. You know, and when I look at a lot of the the ways that art and medicine tend to intersect, um, you know, it's about art as being illustration or a translational tool, or art as as being therapy. And I I think that both all of these projects that you've talked about demonstrate the ways that they can actually function in those roles very well, and that they're effective. Um, but they can go further. Um, so it was not the fact that the surgeon needed artists to come in and go beyond just this, you know, uh, deep I, I observation. Just, just one little thing I want to say, like, yeah. I learned so much from the middle. Like, we were just caught so off guard that most galleries that we, we often show in are not really accessible. They're often far from a, a subway line or a bus line. They often have stairs. The lighting is often harsh. There's no seating. Um, that font is always wrong. It like our, what we have just, our blind spot, and I know not everyone is, but I was very struck by just our exhibition practices were so for able-bodied people. And that really took, I mean, this project just, um, I mean, it has really changed how I now have my exhibitions, um, you know, when I, you know, when I can have some control about that too, like how that changes. So there was a lot of, and I think that's really important. You know, that idea of that, that relationship between the artist and the audience and the viewer. And so, and that really, I have to admit that, the, you know, the scientific team really brought that and many other things home. Sarah Lynn, did you want to ask your question? Well, Ingrid, you led so well into that because you... <laughs> You're questioning everything. And uh, my, my, my question was that I heard you much earlier in the talk, t 
talk about questioning the idea of artistic freedoms. Uh, license is the word you used. And um, I found it so refreshing that from an artist, there's a kind of self doubt about the work that I think feeds authentic, deep research questions. Like, it, so it's, I'm, I'm, I'm making a leap here, but I'm wondering if you and Sean, which I, I felt both of you were doing this, um, um, letting us see into your questions and your own doubts in a really full way, in a kind of material way. And I wondered if you might speak to, to um, how working with something as intimate and as clinical as the body has become might feed or not feed that kind of wellspring of doubt. Yeah. Oh. Again, great question. Tough <laughs> one. Um, I guess you know it's interesting because um, in my the uh, anatomy table, I was thinking about vaccines, uh, but I was thinking more broadly too, just about um, you know attention tensions in relationship to how do we know anything, right? And so I I get I guess what I'm sensing you're asking in the question is how did this particular maybe narrow research question, open up bigger questions creatively. And for me, it definitely led to a greater acknowledgement of the paradoxes of like the body or, or the self. And like, this is a crazy thing to be in, right? It doesn't make any sense when you start to think about it. it it's just full of paradoxes. And so, you know, being with that, I think then could kick back to the specific research question and kind of trouble it. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but for me, it was a kind of back and forth between a narrow question that led to really big questions about what it means to have a body and be alive and, and, and then kind of back, a back and forth. I, so that's my attempt at an answer. <laughs> Beautifully stated, thank you so much. Okay. Well, I think doubt, unfortunately, is my, doubt and curiosity are my two operating kind of Brenda's modi. And I think, um, uh, and I think that's still, those are still really worth keeping that sort of not being sure of what I'm doing and having to listen to the work in that way. And it, it's a very, and also even doubting the structures in which I work, which is both a university um, or contemporary art scene now this other scene. So doubt is, it, it opens everything up. Like it opens up, it's not as, as terrible for me as it, as, it, as, it's, as it used to be. Because from doubt, a lot of things can, can spring up and you know, you doubt, yeah, like about, like, do you have a right to this? And that's very different than self-censoring, I think. It's not about feeling that you have to censor to kind of question, but to just really look at those things you're doing. So, um, and I find that these kind of collaborations just make you really challenge your own conventions and biases and the ones within your field. And I think that also hap like that happened in both the humanities and the medical communities too. And I think that might be the greatest gift. So it might be the work, but I think in some ways the work is also just this, this kind of form for different kinds of, of things to happen. I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> thank you, good thank you. <laughs> you've, you've stated it in your answer better than the question, thank you. Just a quick follow-up because Ingrid's answer was so Terrific, and I, there is again a kind of another paradox, though, for me, in that we live in this time when we desperately need people to trust government, people to trust health messaging, and you know, on the one hand, what Ingrid's saying, you might think it leads to further doubt and predict, but I think again, there's a paradox here where what Ingrid's, what I'm sensing Ingrid's saying is this kind of questioning produces again a kind of more sophisticated moment of pause and reflection. Uh, Rather I think, than Sean, a negative doubt. It's such a great point because I really feel too, like in COVID, we had an app developed by Joshio Bengio, who's a really prominent 
AI developer internationally and also really concerned with AI and ethics. And there was so little buy-in. There was just so little buy-in from the public because there wasn't surveillance attached to it. And so that idea of, again, how we tell the stories, and it's not that artists should be the mouthpieces by any means of politicians or of, of, of scientists, but it's really about like, you know, I think with the vaccine project, that's, that was just such a great way of opening up discussion. And so I think right now in this pandemic where, um, you know, a lot of these same issues about fears and belief come into play that artists could actually play a really interesting role. And also, I think particularly for younger generations who really aren't gonna be watching news, they're gonna be on TikTok or, TikTok or Instagram or something like that. And so, you know, they, they wanna see a younger, hipper face and <laughs> another kind of language, you know, and, and that's really important. Well, I, my brain is also just rolling too, because it, it, I mean, it's also just making me think about, you know, changing roles, you know, in, in museums, we have a lot of museum people here, you know, the changing roles of curators, of being one of, you know, voices of authority um, to ones where, well, in, in my own personal curatorial approach is one that invites collaboration and uh, dissent sometimes and question. And, you know, Ingrid, one of the things you didn't share quite as much that I've heard you mention before is sort of your, your exhibition dress rehearsals, where you put things on view and invite patients and community members to, you know, to, to come and yeah. make comments. And, you know, the, the way that this, this exhibition has opened is uh, there's sort of been a soft rollout because we haven't, we didn't have the big opening with, you know, 200 people in our galleries. And, it has allowed me space like never before to hear, even if it's from our visitors or from even our security, you know, yeah. hey, this, this label isn't working here. I mean, something very, very basic that we can then be responsive to. And that's a very procedural thing, but in a larger intellectual sense, the ways that I think fields are changing more generally, I think yeah. even with faculty and, and teaching. So I think you both stated that so, so beautifully. I'd sort of forgotten about that, but yeah, one of the things we did because we were dealing with living humans experiences, although we were not allowed to name them or show them or use their voice, um, that we had dress rehearsals, which we don't usually have in the visual arts. I mean, of course, in music and theater, that's, you always have that, but those were so important to, to really, for one thing, they allowed that kind of conversation you're talking about. Um, uh, Casey, and also, and they let us really understand how the work was reaching people. And it was also in a way where viewers weren't on, they weren't aware of themselves as a viewer. So they weren't performing as a viewer. And I think we found that with Flux too, because with Flux, the curators or, and the partners organized this workshop where they brought the artists. And in this case, we were able to work with patients directly. They brought us together to do a lot of strange things like these workshops and different games, but it actually really helped to, um, to build discussion. And, you know, there is this idea that, you know, the work springs forth fully formed like Athena from the head of Zeus and comes in a gallery and it just isn't like that and how it's aided by and helped by the conversations around it. I don't know, I think you probably, you might've found that too, Sean, and, and probably with your um, WHO project too, or your UN project. Absolutely. Well, I, I love ending this on the note of how important conversations are because I have really enjoyed this one tonight. Um, thank you, Ingrid and Sean. You've been so generous with your time. Um, I know that, you know, if anyone continue or still has questions and want to be in touch, um, please feel free to email me. I'm sure that I can connect you with Sean or Ingrid, but I just want to once again, join me in thanking Sean and Ingrid for the, their presentations and their work. Um, and thanks to all of you for, for being here and engaging. And uh, I hope to see some of you in the exhibition and at future events. Our next one, like I said, will be on March 23rd at 5.30 p.m. So thank you all. Thank you.